Well, good evening, good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are tuning in from and what time of the day it is or evening. Uh, welcome to Crypto for the Rest of Us. Uh, today, we're going to do a news segment. And a couple of the articles in crypto that I want to talk about are some topics that we actually covered in our first crypto talk with my beautiful co-host, Brianna, uh, which I posted into the channel. So hopefully you got a chance to look at that. This is this is another crypto enthusiast and, and educator uh, that we've teamed up with, that I've teamed up with. And uh, we basically talk about crypto. We talk about experiences. We talk about what we're doing, how we're learning it, how we're spreading the news and the word about crypto to the world and it's just kind of a lot of a lot of fun to get two people together to kind of bounce some ideas off but there were a couple of topics that we discussed that i want to bring up a little bit more detail i found some articles that go into a little bit more and one of them was on self-custody and then the other one the other topic was on ethereum and the the merge so the first article i'm going to look at we're going to look at uh some self-custody nope take that back we're going to look at ethereum first so let me share my screen here and okay there we go all right so ethereum's ethereum's blockchain is nearing a huge turning point that could push ether's market value ahead of bitcoin so i thought this was interesting there's i'm gonna actually do a lot of reading here because i do think that um, there is a lot of interesting detail here so the blockchain behind the second largest cryptocurrency, Ether, will soon undergo a highly anticipated upgrade that many that may lead to more institutional investors putting money into the network and to help lift Ether's price. So this is the merge that we're talking about, and we're talking about what's going to happen because of the merge. But this article goes into some more detail about how it can actually lift the price of Ether and maybe ahead of Bitcoin, which I find interesting. The goal is to make Ethereum, the blockchain being upgraded, more scalable, secure, and sustainable. Among other things, it would make its crypto mining obsolete, thereby reducing the huge amount of energy required to create new tokens, which is a source of intense criticism. So as you may know, one of the issues with proof of work, which is the consensus mechanism of Bitcoin and mostly Ethereum, is that it takes up a lot of energy, a lot of computing power to actually go through this process of validating transactions through the network. Now, Bitcoin is going to hang in there with its proof of work. It's very good at what it does. It's never been hacked. It's very secure. And really, there are not a lot of applications running on top of it that need it to run faster. And since, in my opinion, Bitcoin's main function now is a store of value like digital gold, I'm cool with Bitcoin remaining the way it is, being safe and secure, and just rising in value and price. Now, Ethereum, on the other hand, is completely different. This is a programmable blockchain, which allows other applications to run on top of it. And by using its blockchain technology, we can use all the benefits of blockchain, all the decentralization. And right now, we've got the network being slow and costing us a lot of transactional fees, which they call gas, because of the way uh, Ethereum is set up. And this proof of work, which is slow and also consumes a lot of energy, is not the way we wanna go in the future. And so Ethereum has been working a long time to try to fix this. So they're trying to upgrade the consensus, consensus mechanism to proof of stake, which is where basically you've got people called validators that stake or put their ETH, they put like 32 ETH, I think is to become a basic validator in, in the proof of stake uh, in Ethereum. And at that point, then you can now validate transactions. And so there's a bunch of these validators that actually validate the transactions. It has nothing to do with actually proof of work where you're proving that you can solve a puzzle to then have access uh, to the reward like Bitcoin. Um, this is a, a whole new mechanism that's much faster and uh, is, is secure uh, from what they've, what they've proven and uh, it is the wave of the future. So <clears throat> let me go on now. <clears throat> As of now, Bitcoin is the largest cryptocurrency in the uh, by market value over 804 billion. But Ether, with a current market cap of more than 360 billion, could become the leader after the infrastructure upgrade, which is called the merge. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
Though a timeline isn't definite yet, industry watchers have speculated that the merge could happen this summer. Investors are already betting on that, and there is a lot of money at stake. In addition to powering Ether, Ethereum has been adopted by decentralized finance, or DeFi, applications. Now, these are the applications I talked about that run on top of Ethereum. And other non-fungible token projects, NFTs, so the upgrade could drastically enhance its valuation. So NFTs, as you know, are a big, big deal. And every time an NFT is, is minted and a transaction occurs on the network, it's slow, it costs gas fees. And so again, the upgrade to uh, Ethereum 2.0 is going to solve a lot of that. And so I think NFTs are going to take off, DeFi is going to take off, and not so there'll be more people using Ethereum's network, which is just going to rise the, the value. And I think the only reason that Ethereum is much lower than Bitcoin today is because of these inherent problems with Ethereum. Once they fix, this, fix these, Ethereum is just going to go through the roof. Uh, it, it's going to be massively used. It's already so far ahead of every other blockchain that is programmable in its class. There's so many developers working on it that once they get some of these bugs ironed out, bugs, not bugs, they're just they're inherent uh, issues that they've had to overcome with that blockchain. It's going to boom and it'll boom fast because there's all this pent up demand already there. Now, also, the move to proof of stake will result in 99 percent less energy use. So that's huge. Um, it says the planned upgrade, Ethereum is moving to proof of stake, which will let users validate transactions according to how many coins that they contribute or stake. In return for staking more coins, users have a higher likelihood of being chosen to validate transactions on the network and earn a reward. Now, when I first read this, I thought, oh, well, that's kind of interesting. That means, you know, that the rich are just going to get richer. The people that have more money to put into Ethereum can be these validators and block out everybody that doesn't have as much. Apparently there are mechanisms in place so that this doesn't happen, so that not just one or two big whales uh, can control all the validations, because that would defeat the central decentralization. That would then have control in the, in the hands of a small group of people, which is not the crypto way. And um, I don't know the details of that. If I come across the, the details in a good article, I'll share that with you, um, but don't worry. Ethereum network is not going to be controlled by just a few validators. Okay, so <clears throat> once the merge is complete, Ethereum's blockchain will shift fully to proof of stake chain called the beacon chain, making mining obsolete. Another thought is, what are all these people going to do that are miners now that have all this computers and all this computing equipment going to do when they're basically shut out? Well, I guess they could go to Bitcoin mining. There's already a lot of Bitcoin miners or they're gonna find other ways to use that computer computing power. Maybe they'll use it in graphicals when the meta, uh, graphical, um, what am I trying to say? Computers that have very high graphics uh, and computer power. The metaverse is coming. Uh, lots of play to earn gaming will be out there. So maybe they can move that equipment into that. Uh, we'll see. Uh, as a result, it's predicted, predicted that Ethereum's energy consumption will be up, cut by 99%. Due to the reduced environment impact, it's thought that more institutional investors will want to buy Ether, use its blockchain, and invest in its network and create greater adoption. Again, this is all pointing to Ether going up. Uh, reading this article and a few others, I am convinced that I need to start putting more money in, into Ether right now, especially as it's low. Right now, at the, record, at the time of this recording in June of, of 2022, Ethereum's low, Bitcoin's low, everything's really low. So I am dollar cost averaging into Bitcoin, but I think I'm gonna start a dollar cost averaging into Ether also because it's gonna go up in my opinion. All right, here's another reason. Ether issued, Ether issued is estimated to drop by 90%, which may boost its price. Another reason the price is going to go up is if the demand increases because of what we talked about and the supply now decreases because there won't be Ethereum being mined, well, we know what that is when you've got high demand and low um, supply, prices go up. So, this is all pointing to being very bullish on Ethereum. So um, yeah, I'm gonna get into some Ethereum as uh, sooner than later. All right, so let me grab this other article here, pull it in, there we go. Okay, so now talking about uh, self-custody is no longer a choice, it's an imperative. So as you may or may not know, uh, Celsius uh, and, and the 
Bible Finance froze customer from withdrawing their accounts a couple of weeks ago based upon some liquidity issues they've had and some investing they've had. And as the market is down, they were going to have to liquidate and lose a lot of money in their positions. So they actually froze the accounts. Now, this brings up a lot of controversy because crypto in its initial vision was supposed to be decentralized. It's supposed to not to be controlled. You were not supposed to have your funds frozen in this crypto world. But as we'll see, there are a lot of pseudo crypto type companies that kind of play both sides of the fence in the traditional finance and in the crypto world and Celsius being one of them. And so what they did here, so let me, let me get this font bigger, open this up a little bit. Okay. So let me scroll down here. So centralized exchanges and CFI services such as Celsius and Babel Finance are not really crypto. They're not even blockchain companies. They are essentially banks with less regulation and oversight. They are not issued, they are not insured by entities like the Federal Deposit Insurance Corp, like many financial institutions are, which means that users have little option but to wait and see if there's anything left for them once the dust settles. So what this is, is saying is that we need to watch out because what's happened is because of the, the intricacies of, of crypto and the, and the volatility of the coins going up and down, uh, a lot of companies like uh, Celsius, there's lots of other ones out there, are using the volatility of that asset to uh, bring in new users. But it, they aren't using... Uh, they're, they're not bringing in users in the traditional manner like I like to do and like I teach here in crypto for the rest of us, where you come in, you buy your, uh, you take your fiat, you buy your crypto uh, on these exchanges, and then you move it over to your own wallet, to your own uh, self-custody wallet, where it's not, that money is not on the exchange, it's not controlled by anyone but you. These centralized exchanges and these CFI services basically don't do it that way. They make it really easy for you to get into crypto, but they're sort of covering the back end. And just like banks do, when you deposit your money in a bank, you'll earn some interest. And the bank is going to take that money and loan it out and lend it and you know do what it wants with to, to make more money. And then when you want to take it out, they'll have those reserves hopefully uh, and they and you can take your money out and hopefully earn a little bit of, of interest well in today's world that's worthless they're, they're giving you like a half a percent a quarter of a percent to do this and so in the crypto world you can make a much higher yield um, five six ten um, twenty percent yields and supposedly have the same flexibility of putting your money in and taking out when you want unfortunately because Celsius did this, but they didn't pay attention to what was going on backside of their money and they ran into a, a problem. They've frozen the accounts. So now we're back to this issue of having our money controlled by organizations. So that's the problem here, right? This is what we're trying to get it away, away from. But again, things start to happen and you know companies are going to take advantage of any opportunity they can. And people saw these high yields and thought, hey, this is really good. I'm going to get into it. I'm going to put my money in this centralized or CFI type of government. Problem is they're not insured by anybody. So right now, anybody that has money in Celsius that needs to get their money out, they can't. There's no insurance. There's no, they can't sue them. There's no entity because basically Celsius can do what they want with it, with that money. And in their contract that people signed, it says that they can do this. So... This is the problem that we need to watch out for. We don't want crypto to look just like traditional finance. And if we don't um, pay attention, it's going to creep up on us. So this article says, repeating the past mistakes. It says, as we become more aware of the way in which we're 
being used and abused by these big businesses. Some, at least, are starting to question the value of the service they use. Yet it's also clear that it doesn't stop us from making similar mistakes in our rush to consume the next shiny service we are offered. The crypto industry was birthed by a group of technologists and libertarians who were concerned about the direction of the traditional financial system. They saw the potential that blockchain technology offered and set forth to create a democratic system of finance that did not require human intervention and could be accessed and consumed by anyone, no matter where they lived or the circumstances they found themselves in. And so this is the basis of crypto. But in short, the crypto industry has the capability of providing essential financial services to those who have gone without, while providing an opportunity for everyone to take back control of a critical asset, our money. But in the same way that we have allowed the wholesale capture of our personal data and privacy, a la Facebook and Google, more and more we are ceding control of our access of our money also. Now, to understand how we only have to look at how our relationship with banks has changed. Traditionally, it was quid pro quo, pro quo, quo pro. You deposited your money into account, which the bank invested on their own and on behalf. In return, you received a security, ease of access, excuse me, you received security, ease of access, and return on your investment. Well, today, things are not so simple. Your money is still relatively secure, but you no longer enjoy a return. High inflation, low interest rates, and money printing are causing the value of all of our savings to go down. What's more, regulations have been sold as necessary to keep you and your money safe and are being used to deny you access to your savings. So this is happening in banks. So in two, uh, 2021, thousands of customers of a UK bank had their accounts frozen without warning for no apparent reason. It's still unclear why access was denied. However, one theory is that the bank system had spotted unusual activity and locked the accounts automatically. No questions asked. Then, in 2022, Canada famously froze the bank accounts of truck drivers and their supporters who were dissenting over forceful mandating of bank vaccinations. Here we go. This is already happening, and this is in your traditional banking world. We have the opportunity in crypto to get away from this. But like I said, businesses, when they smell a profit, they're going to they're gonna pop up like Celsius and like some of these pseudo banks that sit on the sidelines of both crypto and traditional finance. We've just got to pay attention and not be lured in by these high yields. Now, I admit that I'm, I'm interested in using crypto for higher yields, but we just need to be careful of the mechanisms, who's controlling it and what options um, that they have to control our money. And then determine, do we still want to use these or not? So I preferably use more decentralized uh, services to, you know, yield farming and some liquidity pools. And uh, there's a lot of completely decentralized organizations that do this and you can earn great yields. And hopefully we'll talk about this more in the future once I kind of get wrap my head around exactly what this is. But I'm looking into some of these completely decentralized um, uh you know, uh, organizations, they're, not, they're, they're protocols, basically. Um, they are uh, DAOs, uh, distributed autonomous uh, organizations that use the blockchain and tokens to then regulate and create liquidity and, and yields. And, um, you know, that's what I'm preferring to do because I don't want to get caught in this situation where they can freeze my, my money. So moving on, it says, and now crypto intermediates like Celsius and Babel Finance are doing the same thing with their customers' assets. This, however, is nothing compared to what might happen should we move to a government-backed digital currency or CBDC. This is, this is slightly moved off, but it's still totally on the topic of what the government can do. Governments are pushing towards these digital currencies. And don't be fooled when the government says, oh, yeah, we like decentralization. We like crypto. We're going to do our own digital currency. And what they're creating is these CBDCs, central bank digital currencies. These are going to be really detrimental because depending on their design, a CBDC can be used to control an individual by limiting how much money that you can hold. They vary interest rates and prices depending on who you are, preventing purchases and automatically deducting fines. So with this, they have much more control if they go this route. Because at least if you've got dollars, they can't shut you out because you've still got some dollars. Um, 
Another big risk is the relationship between digital identity and CBDC. The use of funds can be made conditional on the attributes of your digital identity. If those funds are in CBDC, then the central bank and by implication, the government can control how you spend and receive your money. So this is a very, very slippery, slippery slope. Unfortunately, I'm not sure how we're going to avoid this. Governments have a lot of momentum behind this. And what we can't allow to happen is for them to dupe us into saying, oh, we're going to start playing in you know, the crypto way. We're going to create these digital securities. They're just like crypto. They're not. They're not at all. So don't be fooled by this. CBDCs are not your friend. So we're going to have to pay close attention as the governments around the world are going to start creating these. If they do, we just have to make sure that we push back real hard that they can't control us in the way that this article points out is a possibility. And I've read a lot of different articles about that. And if you're at all concerned about this, please read up on CBDCs because they're not our crypto friends, not at all. Anyway, so taking back control. So to take back control, it's vital that we move away from custodial services that look after our money for us and move to self-custodial products and services that puts us in full control of our digital assets. So as we talked about in the Crypto Talks with Brianna, you've got to move your assets into a, a, a hot wallet and preferably into a cold wallet like the um, digital, like this is the, the ledger. So this is like a thumb drive and this holds the keys and and the my crypto in here no one can act no one can get this it's all right here so no government can shut this down this is mine i have control of it so the assets that are in here are mine now if i lose this then i'm sol you know so i can't lose i have to be responsible but it puts the own the onus on me i'm responsible it's my money and i'm going to take care of it and that's what we really want to move to here. Now, I may sound like I'm coming off like a like a maximalist here, like a crypto Bitcoin maximalist, like, you know, don't touch my money. I'm not that really at all. I understand that there's going to be a need for some regulation, for government to come in, you know, and be a player in here. I get it. But I want to be in control of this. And right now I am. So one thing is I don't want them to be able to get in and take my control and access away from my crypto and I don't want them to put legislations that allows that. But can they make it safer? Yeah, I think it would be good. And can they you know, watch out for the bad guys, keep the bad guys out? Yeah, I think that would be good. So we just have to continue to watch this ourselves. And if it looks like it's leaning that way, we've got to push back to our congressmen in any way we can, um, in, that, we can that we can make a change. With self-custodial products and services, the user takes ownership and responsibility for the keys to their digital assets be they coins or NFTs, as well as the asset themselves. The user controls how, when, and to what certain extent their assets are used. Unfortunately, we've gotten off to a bad start. While we have made huge strides towards mainstream adoption, the cryptosphere remains a complex ecosystem to navigate. In the main, self-custodial services are extremely unuser-friendly to use and particularly require a physics degree, practically require a physics degree to onboard. Now, I don't think it's that bad, but I have to admit that that is one of my goals is to help us understand how to have self-custody. And although it can be a few more steps than you're used to, the payoff is greatly worth it, not only just in self-control and the fact that, you know, outside governments and organizations can't shut you down or take your money or keep you from accessing it, but you can earn high rewards, yields, and uh, asset growth. But you got to find somebody that can you know, teach you the right way and teach you slowly and give you the confidence. And that's what we do at Crypto for the rest of us is that I try to help people understand the best, the safest way to get into crypto and then become keep it safe and secure. And it's not that bad if you just take your time and we go slow. And uh, it, But it's extremely important. So Rounding this off, it says, so it comes as no surprise that people are opting instead to participate in these custodial services like crypto wallets. Now, they call crypto wallets like exchange, like Coinbase. You put your money in there and it's held by Coinbase. They are the custodials of that. What you want to do is then move that, literally move it and send it off to your private hot wallet, <clears throat> like a MetaMask wallet, an Exodus wallet, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> or a cold wallet like the Ledger Nano, which 
is then completely off of the internet and you hold it. Um, providers like Coinbase, Crypto.com, and others are making onboarding process simple and they get people up and running quickly. While that has certainly accelerated adoption, which is a good thing, it's also antithetical to taking back control. So like I said, it is a good thing that they're making it easier, but you do need to know what goes on behind. You cannot let uh, the ease and simplicity of getting into crypto uh, lure you into then not being careful with it. So just take that extra step. Learn and find out how to get into crypto, but then move it into your own wallet. It's not that hard. It's not that big a deal, really. It's just that people that don't know about it or they're afraid of it or they're, you know, they just take the easy way. And believe me, these companies like Coinbase and Crypto.com, these, these the central exchanges that are companies that are traded on the New York Stock Exchange. So they're not decentralized crypto organizations. Um, they are going to do everything in their power to convince you to use them by making it simple or seem like it's really simple. And, you know, that's great as long as you don't stop there. You take that next step and move your assets into um, a, a hot wallet or a cold wallet. And like I said, it's not that hard. It's not that hard. So essentially by signing up for custodial services, people are giving up control for convenience. Like I said, if we continue on this path, we will lose the opportunity for positive change and instead replicate the old world of finance in the new with all its incumbent unfairness and big problems that we are seeing now. So simply said, uh, we do not want the old fashioned traditional finance world to be ported over into the wonderful world of crypto where we have much more control options and new technologies and uh, the ability to actually make a real yield and to have some savings. Because right now in traditional finance, not only is inflation going up, which means our, our dollar is worth so much less. Wouldn't you rather be into a hard asset like Bitcoin that's just not going to lose that inflationary, um, it's not It's not going to lose value to inflation. And more about that, check out my, my video on what is Bitcoin. It talks a lot about why Bitcoin is deflationary and uh, really is like digital gold. But, you know, we, we, we just don't want to see the governments come in, the organizations take control, you know, of this new finance. And they're, they're worried, they're scared, they're losing control. But I think we can have both. We can have some of their input and still remain true to the crypto world uh, where we can con control uh, our finances. And we have a really good shot at making a, a decent yield. And, um, you know, if we pick the right coin, that pick the right asset at the right time, we can, you know, you know benefit from that. So um, anyway, so that's it for today. Um, I, hopefully you gained a little bit of insight to these two important topics that are really key to crypto and uh, that is self custody and Ethereum and uh, how betting on Ethereum now is probably a really good idea. So thanks for listening. Tune in next time. Uh, crypto for the rest of us. Hopefully next week we're going to have another Crypto Talks with Brianna and there'll be no more news and crypto ideas here from Crypto Hero. We'll see you next week. Bye.